Hello, my name is Matthew Ricks and I'm a consultant hand, wrist and upper limb surgeon at Wrightington Hospital in the UK. I've um, been invited to come and give you a lecture on the plating of a distal radius fracture as part of this webinar series. So thank you very much for the invite for that. So I'll be covering volar plating for a distal radius fracture. There's a certain learning objectives that we're going to look at during this lecture, how to assess a distal radius fracture, how to perform the volar approach, key reduction techniques that I use, how to perform a solid fixation, and how to assess whether the fixation is adequate. We're addressing the column theory in other lectures, but just to touch upon, this is key for you to identify the different fracture configurations that you have to appreciate which fixation method you're using and that you're using the correct one because it's important that you understand the fracture of the distal radius bone quality so you can restore the angle and heights that we know about that we're looking at to restore the distal radius this will be covered as well in another area of the lecture but what we're planning to do is restore the radial height radial inclination and ideally the volar tilt so you need to know when K wiring is a limitation. You need to be considering whether you do an intraarticular fixation with something like a volar or dorsal plate. So if you're seeing intraarticular comminution, a lunate die punch injury, or dorsal comminution, these ones are very difficult to hold a reduction if you're using a K wiring technique. And so these are the ones you need to start considering whether you're going to do a volar plating to allow adequate fixation of those fragments and hopefully early mobilization of them. So how do I perform a volar plating? So patient is supine, arm board with a tourniquet on, centrally positioned within the laminar flow with a single leg arm board. This allows the mini uh, C arm to sweep in and out. I would sit in the axilla with a fellow sitting opposite uh, side of the arm table and the scrub nurse sitting at the end of the arm table. This allows you to have a seated position operating with the mini C arm swinging in and out. I perform the volar approach to the wrist I feel for the FCR and the longitudinal access of the wrist. I then mark up a skin incision of four and a half centimeters in length based upon the FCR going from the proximal wrist crease coming um, proximally. I then incise through the FCR. Now you can take the FCR either radially or only. In this situation, we've taken it radially. Therefore, the FCR is aiding in protecting the radial artery. But you need to be aware of the nervous structures that are at risk on the ulnar side of the FCR that you're approaching. If you take the FCR only, then you need to be aware of the radial, radial artery that's on the radial portion uh, and a risk of that. So once we go through, we do the skin incision, we sweep our finger across and you can see that what we're coming down to is palmaris quadritis at the bottom. And then you can see that from the transverse fibers. So I use my finger to sweep away the tissues. I use the self retainer to help aid in the exposure to push those tissues aside, giving you the exposure of PQ. I then do an L shaped incision along the border, the radial border of PQ, and then coming along the distal portion of PQ through the fire, through the muscle fibers, deliberately to preserve those distal wrist ligaments that come in and so this allows you to sweep back and reflect back the the um tissue to give you an exposure to the distal radius fracture. In this situation, you can see how we've got the ra radius exposed, we've got the fracture line exposed. I pass the McDonald through the volar fracture line then through the dorsal fracture line, then that helps aid my reduction. And I can help pull and translate using a similar technique to the Kapanji technique, um, bringing back that dorsal fragment back in. I can also pull and manipulate as well if needed to help aid my reduction. Once I've done that, I tend to temporarily hold the fracture with a K wire running through the radial styloid. This makes my plating easier to perform. In this situation, you can see we've reduced the fracture back into position and we've checked our angles. Now, there's ways of using the plate to aid reduction as well. This situation, you can see we've used the sliding hole of the plate. We've reduced it down with the non-locking screw. And then what we've done is we position the plate distally to allow us to get a non-locking screw, engage the, the dorsal cortex to allow us to aid that last bit of reduction of volar tilt. So we're using the plate and the screws to help aid our reduction. And then I'd fill the rest of the screws up with a non-locking uh, sorry, with a locking screw configuration. Now, one of the key elements you need to identify is your radial styloid fracture. So you need to look at the fracture configuration. You need to get a solid fixation for this. I tend to do this with two screws. I tend to do it under image guidance, and I tend to sit the screws under subcortically to allow them to provide a buttress to hopefully aid in preventing that collapse back down. Once you fix the radial styloid, it's important to assess whether there's any other fracture configurations or whether there's any um, 
inadequacy to your fixation, you need to augment these. So if I have any doubt in the quality of the fixation or quality of bone, then I may aid my, redu my reduction of fixation with either a radial styloid plate, K wires, or any other the fragment specific plates if I felt it needed it. So once I've done my final fixation, I will check for screw penetration, both the AP, lateral and carpal shoot through, and then I'll look for stability of the fracture. And again, if I have any concerns, I will augment my volar plate fixation with other plates or other K wires if required. <clears throat> I'd also look for an associated injury. And depending upon what I find, I'll make a decision whether I can mobilize these early. Now, ideally, I would get these patients in a large bulky bandage, which comes down in a couple of days time, and then a Futura splint, allowing them to gently mobilize to try and decrease that stiffness and to get that function and range of movement back. But the key factors when assessing a fracture, particularly for a volar plating, is you need to understand the fracture pattern. You need to think about how am I going to reduce these fragments, how am I going to hold these fragments, and whether it's best to do it via volar, dorsal, or K-wiring. And once you've done your fixation, check that the fixation is stable. And always think, do I need to supplement that fixation? I have a low threshold to use extra plates, fragment-specific plates, radial styloid plates, or K-wires, if I fe felt that my fixation needed the augmentation. And a key factor is to make sure they mobilize early. Thank you very much.